All right. So my name is Aaron Yarmel, and I'm joined here today by Matt Johnson from DXE. Um, so Matt and I have been friends for a couple of years. We've, we've been you know, in touch about a lot of the important news of the day as it's happened in the, the animal rights community. And uh, Matt, it's really great to finally have you in front of the camera with me. So thank you so much for, for stopping by. Definitely. Likewise, I feel like we're, we're kind of taking the conversations that have happened over at your house and on WhatsApp and all these different conversations that have sprawled on for hours and giving it the recording it and putting it out there for the world. So hopefully people like it. Yeah, this will be good. I'm looking forward to it. Um, all right. So before we get started into like our, our really juicy kinds of topics that we're going to talk about today, do you want to just talk a little bit about you know, who you are, how you got to join DXE mm -hmm. and just what you're all about? Yeah, so my name is Matt Johnson. I was born and raised in Iowa, actually not too far from where Aaron's at right now. And uh, I mean, if we go way back, I was uh, I had an experience at the age of four that I think is actually a pretty common experience where I was traumatized, uh, I think is the best word for it, uh, at figuring out that this what's in front of me on my plate is, is the body of an animal. And so that kind of sat with me for a while. I was a little confused, you know, I was a little torn, I should say, by uh, religion was the big thing where I was like, well, God gives animals for food, but this seems really horrible to me as a kid. So, you know, that led to basically 20 years of kind of silent and confused vegetarianism. Then I became an adult and got some different ideas about religion, uh, which uh, led me to think, you know, I think that that four-year-old was onto something. Uh, so then I got very involved in it, decided this, this was a, uh, a pressing issue, uh, not only extremely dire issue, but it's something that's completely ignored. And one thing leads to another, like, okay, this is an issue that I should dedicate a lot of time to, kind of dedicate my life to. And the conversation goes on, like, okay, what's the best way to act upon that? And uh, I decided that uh, community building uh, being the basis of uh, pretty much every successful social movement throughout history, I decided that the uh, the place and time for me was uh, DXC in Berkeley, and so I've been here since 2016 doing the doing some press work uh, is is kind of my main focus, but also just a little bit of everything involved in investigations, involved in um, community events, uh, organizing, just just a, a little bit of everything. Um, living the life, it's been a wild ride, and uh, probably only going to get more wild as, as things continue to unfold. Yeah, that is wild. One thing that I don't think we've ever actually talked about is, maybe we've talked about it, but your, uh, your, your, your religious past um, that, that happened before you were four and you had all these sorts of questions. So you, did you grow up like you were, you were raised Christian? Yeah, Christian. Uh, my mom's side was uh, or is Lutheran. Uh, my dad, actually, when I was uh, like six or seven, my dad became Jehovah's Witness. So this, mm. this whole, um, yeah, I, I got exposed to a lot of perspectives. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because my parents sort of had their like disagreements or feuding between those two, you know, the factions within Christianity, which I think in some way kind of led me to think like, oh, wait a second, if they're not united in this, maybe, you know, they're not so sure that each other is right. Maybe, right. maybe in a bigger picture, a lot of stuff isn't right, you know? Yeah. Um, I've so, heard yeah, about I mean, that a lot. Like I've heard that actually a good way to make sure that your kids become atheists is to have um, parents of various different faith traditions. You can see that there's yeah. different. Yeah. Sorry. I interrupted <laughs> or, you though. Yeah. Or, 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 or whatever faith tradition you're in. If you actually read the Bible, I think that tends to do the trick. <laughs> right. Bible's a great argument for atheism. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, All right. Well, now that we've alienated right. like a third of our viewers, two minutes yeah. in, let's just keep it going. Let's try to get the other, the other two thirds as we go. Um, but I guess I wanted to ask you though, did, did you find that there's any sort of religious traditions are inspiring to you as you think about your activism? Like I know that um, one important social movement person who influenced DXE a lot is, is Dr. King. And when you read his writings, you get a lot of references to his very strong faith tradition. Um, so like, I don't know, did you ever find yourself drawing from any of that? I don't think I personally have. I mean, I, I certainly think that kind of where I land, you know, getting there from a secular perspective aligns with, with Buddhism. Uh, you talk yeah. about uh, Anada, I mean, you look at these Buddhist monks who, you know, will light themselves on fire. We've had, we've had those conversations too. Yeah. Uh, you know, but, but I, I do think that that's sort of is in the, the spirit of what I try to hold myself accountable to, which, you know, is more or less, you know, just kind of looking at the collective impact and it's saying like, well, you know, what, what, what would it really mean, you know, for me to go to prison or for me to, you know, for me to suffer whatever I'm going to suffer, you know, it's, it's just relatively nothing compared to relative to, 
the power that we all have to make a difference if we apply ourselves, if we try to do the right thing, if we're willing to, you know, do whatever. Jump on a stage at a Bernie Sanders rally, investigate a farm, go to prison, like move to Berkeley, like, you know, that sort of thing. Those, those are all really small sacrifices compared to, you know, what really matters. So in yeah. a roundabout way, I think there's an inspiration there. Okay, cool. And that was like, I mean, what I love about that, uh, what you just said was that it's really kind of a, in a nutshell, what we'll be talking about today. Um, you know, jumping out of Bernie Sanders stage rally, uh, mm-hmm. investigating a farm and, uh, well, there's always the, the risk of prison. We're going to be talking about some laws. So why don't, mm-hmm. why don't we get into like Iowa, right? So you you grew up in Iowa. Um, you've been back to Iowa a couple of times recently for some investigations. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about, about that? Definitely. So uh, I was born and raised in Iowa, as you mentioned, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just such an interesting kind of dichotomy because on one hand, this is the place that that's kills so many more animals than any other state, like animal ag is king. Uh, and, and, and it's a horror show that nobody is really seeing or noticing or observing or, or questioning, you know, not, not literally nobody, but as a general matter. And at the same time, you have the like the there's the hospitality like there's this like a culture and like a vibe that's just so welcoming and so so relaxed and so inclusive and kind and all this good stuff i mean my brother like literally so i go to iowa and i'm doing these investigations or i'm i'm, I'm leading these disruptions that literally are you know going against the dairy industry the dairy pride act that elizabeth warren sponsored and bernie sanders has a long history supporting the the um the dairy industry Meanwhile, my brother literally married into a dairy family. That was last year when I came to Iowa. The reason I, the reason I had planned to go to Iowa was because my brother was getting married uh, to his, his girlfriend that he's known for forever. So they, they welcomed me into their home. Like I'm staying with my brother, with his girlfriend, who's very proud of her, her family. And, and they're very nice people. And they have this dairy farm, you know. And so we get up in the morning and my brother and his fiance slash wife, you know, will go off to help at the farm and we'll go off to protest Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. And, you know, it's, um, it's, it's very interesting. And I mean, it, it's very grounding in terms of the ultimate enemy, the ultimate, you know, message here, which is the system, yeah. not the individuals. And so, you know, it's been a little tense and a little tough for her in various ways. And that's understandable, but we've had a lot of good conversations that have, um, you know, I think yeah. if, if progress things forward uh, and sorry, just to get to specifically with, well, with the investigation, yeah, just like actually before we do that, can we just pause on that first part? Cause that is, that is super interesting. What are the conversations like around the dinner table when you're at their house and they ask you what you do? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's been, it's been years coming. So sure. there, these conversations were kind of years ago, but it, um, I, a lot of it honestly has to do with my own personal evolution because there, I didn't sort of have that understanding or that grounding, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I went, there was the typical new vegan angry phase or whatever. So there were some, you know, there, there was one particular Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving evening where there was alcohol involved. Things got a little heated. I slept in the room that I was supposed to sleep in. <laughs> um, but you know, kind of when I sort of came around to the kind of accurate and productive perspective, then things moved along, along pretty well. And it's just, I mean, I, I genuinely believe if I sit down and have a conversation with anybody, those conversations, I mean, I, I sat down, I did an interview with, with Ben O'Brien, who's this big name um, in the, um, he has this hunting, it's called the Hunters Collective podcast. So he's all about hunting. But if we sit down and have a real conversation, we, we end up like agreeing, <laughs> actually agreeing fundamentally on everything. We end up saying, like, well, yeah, what would be the harm? But how could it go wrong? Really, if we elevate the rights of a group of people do we say oh we elevated the rights of you know whatever uh of women of people of color we we protect protections for children protect you know shot down the line so i mean do you really think that elevating the rights of animals is gonna you know like no nobody actually thinks that it's all just kind of in the here and now it's all just kind of this conjecture that's put out there by whoever put out there by the media put out there by the industry these people are trying to you know destroy you destroy your way of life like whatever um and, you know, you have real conversations with people and that's just not the reality. So that's really is the challenge that we face as a movement is to, is to unite and to get the real message out there and to, to bring people together against really our, our collective enemy, Yeah, which is, which is, you know, these, infra, these institutions, speciesism and animal ag and so on and, and not the individuals. Yeah, that, that is, that is amazing to hear. So it's like, I mean, we, you talk about um, like mixed 
marriages or like mixed families with with political differences. So yeah. I, one I think a lot of is Kellyanne Conway and her is her husband George Conway. Is that his name? Whatever his name is. Um, yeah, but anyways, the, the, you know, the two of them are he's like tweeting against Trump, and then she's doing her her thing. Mm-hmm. And I could imagine uh, like like a, one of the clearest pictures of that would be to take you know, you, the kind of work you do, professional, full-time activist, actually going into the farms and exposing them and being one of the most vocal support, like, you know, um, critics of the abuse of the dairy industry in the same family with this, like, dairy family and being able to sit down and have a conversation. So it's just like, I want to pause on that because I just, like, I didn't know about this before. And yeah. it's such an amazing, um, I don't know, c- compelling, salient image that, I think people should uh, should have have in mind, and just, yeah. just to, yeah, just to, to to think that like you can do all the stuff you do and still be able to sit down and have these kinds of regional conversations is really inspiring. De- yeah, definitely, and and I I should just like give a shout out like Caitlin. I don't know if you're ever going to see this or her family. Like shout out to them because that it would be very easy for them to to just really stonewall that. Be yeah. like this. You think he's about to come in here and stay in my house when he's doing you know X Y Z? Like, I, I mean, and there was a little vibe of that, but like I think. Mm-hmm in terms of like, this is your whole identity. This is your whole family background and whatnot. I think they've been very accommodating and, you know, and, and very reasonable and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah. 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 So kudos to them for having the reasonable conversations too. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, cool. So, so, so let's get into it. So tell me about the investigation in Iowa. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so this would have been in, uh, last year. So 2019, my brother's getting married. I'm going to Iowa and then uh, this uh, ag gag law that Iowa had got struck down. And then there was a new ag gag law proposed. I was kind of reading about it without, you know, just I just read stuff, whatever. I found in the comment section, oh, this uh, senator that was behind this law um, was the floor manager for the new ag gag law. So the one got struck down in January of 2019. And then literally two months later, they had this new law passed, which anybody who follows sort of legislative, you know, type things like that, that's, that's lightning fast. That doesn't happen. You don't pass a lot in two months unless it's like top priority. So it got passed. And, and anyway, looking at the comment section, somebody's talking about like, oh, I wonder if this had anything to do with this guy's pig farm that he has. It's like, oh, interesting. So one thing leads to another. Well, I'm going to be in Iowa anyways, have some conversations, like lined it all up. So, you know, we went to and investigated the Senator's pig farm and, um, it, I mean, it was horrible, but I, as, as much as I say it was, it was horrible, what we found in there, it was pretty typical uh, of, of factory farms. And so, uh, you know, we're talking about things like massive uh, in, intensive crowding of animals where they which don't have any room to move around, filthy conditions. Obviously, the animals are just, you know, all day, every day um, living in there. You know, desert, it basically gets cleaned out at the, at the end of the cycle, you know, when they're all taken out and killed. Other than that, it just kind of eventually sort of mucks up and falls through the slats in the floor. Uh, we're talking about a lot of animals who had, uh, sorry to go, you know, go there, but if, just to give people an idea, uh, rectal and anal prolapses, like literally their insides are like falling out of them and getting drug, you know, in their own filth and, you know, just coated in their own feces. Other pigs that are, you know, in those kind of conditions, they're just so stressed, they're so anxious or aggressive, so they're literally biting so you have animals that are running around with their insides hanging out, getting covered in feces, that are getting bitten by the other animals. So we, you know, documented all this. We got a veterinarian uh, opinion saying that this is horrible abuse. It's also criminal abuse. We got a, uh, a former federal prosecutor t- saying, you know, to that same effect, uh, and submitted it to to the relevant authorities. And their response uh, not only was to to disagree with us and say nothing to see here, totally cool. Uh, it was to for, for the senator himself to call for us to be prosecuted. And now, and, and I, I don't know if you want to get into this right now, a whole the, a, a, a barrage of new bills that have got that are just shamelessly pro industry. I mean, I've seen a lot, and I, I you know I do this like this is my full time deal. Um, never seen anything like like the kind of legislative response we've seen in Iowa, which I think is actually a, a I mean, it's it's horrific and it's immoral. I think it's also bad tactically on their part uh, because it just it it it's going to blow back in their face. Yeah. So what? Well, yeah. So so I think let's um, well, I think let let's hold off on the bills for a second. But just some foreshadowing. I was a little bit skeptical when you first described what these bills looked like, and then I looked at them and I was like, "Holy crap! Like, I've, <laughs> this is just it, it's it's got to be a joke, like what they're doing." But yeah, so mm-hmm. we'll talk more about that. Um, but one thing I wanted to make sure to, to follow up on is you said these are these are pretty typical conditions, right? 
And I think mm-hmm. that what, what a lot of people say, you know, and I've, I've, I teach these issues sometimes, people, people will say like, hey, of course we're against the worst excesses of factory farming, and of course you can find horror stories, um, but my local small farm doesn't do these sorts of things. Or instead of looking at the horror stories, we should look at the typical cases. I mean, they're two distinct things, but people will say both of those things. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of quickly speak to that in light yeah. of what you've seen Right. So, so right off the top, so 99% of the animals used for food are living in factory farm settings. Uh, so sh- straight away, and I mean, uh, Sentience Institute did some good research on that. If people, if you Google Sentience Institute 99%, you should be able to pull that right up there. Um, and that statistic is largely due to the fact that it's around 95% of the animals, uh, land animals used for food. Actually, if you get into fishes, it becomes even more skewed. But talking about land animals, 99%, and that's because the vast majority of land animals used for food in the U.S. are chickens, and, and basically all chickens. I mean, you talk about a chicken, uh, Costco, for example, has their 499 rotisserie chickens. Well, if you're talking about 499, and Costco, I think they lose a little bit of money on this, but you know, let's just say it's you know seven eight dollars, whatever for for the entire life cycle of a chicken. What kind of what kind of individualized care goes into that? I mean, we're talking from incubating an egg to the egg growing to food to paying workers to come through to transport to slaughter to packaging the whole thing uh I, I, you know i mean eighty dollars wouldn't 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 cut it eight hundred dollars might cut it if you're talking about what a, re, a, a normal reasonable person not a vegan not an animal rights activist an ordinary person says is like is like a, a a respectable level of care would you be like the level of care you'd give to a pet a quote-unquote pet uh you know a companion animal so if you if your cat is sick, you take the cat to the vet. If it costs five hundred dollars, you you pay five hundred dollars. That's what happens. Uh, and and for an eight dollar rotisserie chicken, you know that that's just that's just not built into it. So there is the the one percent of those individuals would be the ones that are that are visible, and it's it's not by accident. So you're driving down the highway, you might see a hundred barns on your on your. You know, if you're driving through Iowa, you're going to see a, a bajillion barns. You don't know what the heck's in there. Is it a tractor? It might just be a tractor. It might be nothing. It might be empty. Or there's a very good chance it contains like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 birds. And, and, but you don't think anything of it because you don't see what's in there. And, but you might be, as you drive down the road, you do come across a pasture that looks, you know, scenic. And, and there's 30 cows that look like they're very content. And they, they probably are pretty content. Uh, so, you know, it, it's not a mistake. It's not an accident that people see what they see and they don't see what they don't see. Uh, so. You know, I just challenge people to to kind of think these things through and, and not rely so heavily on your intuition because your intuition is, uh, you know, carefully crafted by the uh, the systems that play around you. Yeah, thank you. And so, so you're you know you're you're in this farm and there's pigs walking around with like prolapsed rectums and there's all sorts of organs hanging out. They're um, covered in feces. The pigs are biting each other. When you go to a place that like a place like Chipotle or or a place that says we get our animals from places that have very high welfare standards. Um, would you anticipate in general that that's the kinds of conditions that these pigs are coming from? Yeah, it very much is. I mean, if we're going to be really kind of splitting hairs and be as generous as we know how to be a place like a Chipotle, a place like a whole foods is going to be marginally better, but I do mean marginally. Okay. And, uh, and so, and that's, and that's what you see a lot of times in, in the, the marketing of animal agriculture is that they won't define things in absolute terms. They'll define things in relative terms. And they do this. I mean, the, the, actually, the worst example of this is when they talk about um, sustainability and environmentalism. It'll be like, oh, these animal activists say that, you know, it's bad for the climate. But do you know that the dairy industry has improved its carbon footprint by 33% over the past decade? It's like, okay, so it went from just unfathomably horrible to 33% less horrible, you know? And so it's like, oh, okay, you have improved standards. Okay, well, what, what was the old standards and what, what specifically, specifically, they don't like to get into specifics, do these new standards really look like? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, and if, and if we ultimately go big picture, and I, I say this for your audience, not for your sake, mm-hmm. uh, it's, you know, you have a society where, where these individuals are, are treated as objects rather than treated as individuals. So you, you're, you're running up against what do we get out of the animals and whatever that's the, the mentality, that's where that conversation is starting. You're just going to end up with much worse outcomes for those individuals. Then if you start, where, where do these conversations, you know, uh, a parallel conversation we'd have about humans. If there's a human who's vulnerable, who's in need, who can't survive on their own, we say, how do we help them? And, and so that's because we're respecting them as a legal person. Um, and, and you just, 
vastly different outcomes. So that's, that's ultimately where this conversation um, needs to lead. Like, look at the horrible things that are happening to animals in the here and now. And then the solution is, is, is not to keep trying to play this game of, you know, exploiting them while maybe treating them better. The solution is, is to elevate, you know, to, to give them the rights that they've always deserved. Excellent. I completely agree. And so there's this weird, like mathematical thing that just doesn't, doesn't add up. When you talk, like 90% of the people you talk to claim that they're, that they're eating animal products that come from conditions that like far less than 1% of the animals live in. So you have like 90% of people saying that they, they're eating like 1% of the stuff produced, which is just, it just doesn't work out. But l- let's go back to that like hellish pictures you described where you're like in the farm, you see these pigs walking around, um, they're suffering in ways that are just far more excruciating than anything that I could ever conceive of happening to to myself or anybody who I, I care about. And I guess like, like, what is that like to see? Like, can you tell us what it, what it feels like to actually be in that kind of a space with suffering of that level? I think it's uh, extremely traumatic for, for, I mean, I mean, I, myself, the four-year-old kid in me, that's, that's, I could certainly relate to that. I would say my own personal experience, not that this is even like, a, I don't know, there's pros and cons to the fact that I've kind of become numb to it. I just have seen so many videos and whatever, been inside of so many farms and I've just have, you know, ruminated on this stuff time and time again. So for me, it's, there is just kind of a objective kind of cold, uh, whatever uh, element to it where I, I'm just, I have a job to do and I do it. Uh, but yeah, I think certainly for people who are unfamiliar with it or people who are doing it for the first time, it's, uh, extremely challenging. So, um, yeah, it's, it's part of the job. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's so insightful. So it's like, there's this four-year-old part that is still traumatized, but luckily he has, you know, experienced Matt to stand in, in the way and kind of protect him and be able to process the things that, that are, are going on right in front of you. Is, is that, is that a fair characterization? Yeah. I, um, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's, it's been a wild journey cause it's, uh, yeah. so I mean, it helps me not to relate to, to, to people. I mean, I, I, another thing when I was a, when I was like, maybe this was like five or six, like right when I was, uh, you know, so I just, just to back up on that one a little bit. So mm-hmm. I, I went to my parents and I had never heard of the word vegetarian. Sure as hell had never heard of the word vegan. So I, when I, and I, I didn't even use the word meat. I went to my parents and I think this is really telling. And I, I, the word, the way I said it, I'm like, I don't want to eat animals. It wasn't like, I don't know about this meat stuff or like whatever. It's just like animals, like, no, I'm not going to eat animals. And one particular experience uh, that came shortly thereafter was when this kind of, you know, got around to my family, like, oh, Matthews, you know, whatever. Uh, my family calls him Matthew. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, I had some family members who are deer hunters and this was around Christmas time. And so they're like, Hey, Matthew, come out here to the shed. And, uh, they had strung up this deer that they had killed upside down and they painted the deer's nose red. And it wasn't like, I like thought like, Oh, this is Rudolph the red nosed reindeer. But what I did think was like, these people are monsters. And it was very, yeah. I mean, you think of polarization as something which is, uh, bad, uh, you know, but sometimes it could kind of, be useful in, in a way because I think that if I had the experience that a lot of uh, children typically have when they sort of experience this this really traumatizing experience of, of realizing what we do to animals, um, where, where you know where a lot of kids are, their parents are like, oh yeah, I know it's good that you care and you know and we're trying to do this, but you know it's really you know, whatever they say to like kind of normalize it and make it like soft. For me, it was nothing like that. The people around me uh, were it was just very abrasive and cold and kind of mocked. And I don't know. I mean, like if, if I didn't have that experience, if I had like more of the soft landing that a lot of kids have, like maybe I'd be a very different person today. It's, it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting thing to think about. So you had to build like this protective part much earlier than a lot of other kids did. You had to sort of build this thing that could kind of process this, all this traumatic stuff coming in from, from the hunters in your family. Um, where if you had been more, uh, if it had been like like a more soft presentation, you might not have needed to do that. Is that is that what I'm I hearing? think? Yeah, yeah. I, I possibly. Yeah, it's 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 really hard to say, but because sure. I just I think because I try to figure, you know, I've given this some thought, you know, like why did I, you know, I have a common experience. I mean, there's videos mm-hmm. all over YouTube and Facebook, the kids that are like traumatized that were eating animals or whatever, they figure that out. Uh, what what made me 
you know, go down a different path than everybody. And I, that's kind of my best guess. So I don't know, maybe there, you know, maybe it's more genetic. Maybe there's just something in my brain that's more, I don't know, wired sure. towards that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's probably possible to know. I, I tend to trust people's intuitions when it comes to like the stories of how their protective parts form. But this, this is really interesting. We're getting into so much about, yeah. So, so let's, um, let's get into some of these bills. And maybe what you could do is there, there's two of them that we talked about right before uh, we got on this call. Let me, let me pull them up. So one of them was um, 2214 and the other was uh, 2238. Mm-hmm. Tw- sorry, 2388. And do you want to just describe what these things are about? And then we can talk about sure. them. Well, let me, if I could just one okay, quick step back sure. to lay the groundwork here. So, so we, we did this investigation that I described and that was April of 2019 when I was in Iowa. Um, and then we uh, did our communications work, got the press set up and the social media and whatnot. We released it uh, intentionally timed around the Iowa primary. So that came out in January of, of this year, January of 2020. And um, as soon as it came out, this Senator, uh, Iowa State Senator Ken Rosenboom, excuse me, he's in the press and he's uh, uh, calling for me to be prosecuted for this. He's blaming the conditions that we exposed on someone who he says he had the property leased out to. He hasn't produced a name. He hasn't produced a document. He hasn't produced any sort of proof of that. May or may not be true. I don't know. But then what happened was that he um, uh, proceeded to get very busy with, pa- actually, sorry, <laughs> one more step in this process. Uh, I was already in Iowa and he's already saying I need to be prosecuted. He's already saying all these horrible conditions aren't my fault. Somebody else was in charge, but I'm in charge now. So everything's fine. So I'm in Iowa. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I wasn't really planning on doing this, but the way things have unfolded, I think this is an opportunity that we should jump on. So I kind of scrambled to put some pieces together, got more people together. And we went back to his farm while we were in Iowa. This was a week after our first investigation comes out. We go back to the farm and, um, and it was, you know, I mean, slight, again, like I'll just be as generous as I think I can honestly be to him is to say that it was like a bit improved. I think the overcrowding was worse. There was some signs of, um, respiratory infection. We had pigs that were biting the, the bars, um, which is if people are familiar, uh, pigs in gestation crates off. I mean, they're just driven insane. That's what that is. It's just like this, like re- repetitive behavior. Um, so, we went, you know, we did the investigation release. Then a week later, we went to the farm. They figured out that we were in the farm. And I mean, this is, we're talking within the span of like two weeks or so, all these bills were suddenly introduced. So cracking down big time. And these bills were written very clearly based upon the timing of them and the actual content of them very clearly in response to us and trying to thwart the other work that we're doing. Uh, so just to give that backdrop, uh, and I forgot what your specific question necessarily yeah well i guess before we get to that so when you say that they're marginally better what do you mean uh i I think that um i mean we didn't find prolapses i mean that was the most like disgusting and and horrific egregious thing probably we also on the first visit we found there was a pig that had some sort of um agonal the the word is like agonal distress that's kind of the scientific term but basically a a pig is a what looks like just having a seizure in front of you, like gasping and thrashing and then laying on the ground, like trying to stand up, trying to gasp for air and then just dies right in front of us. Just, I mean, the most horrific thing imaginable. Wow. So between that and, and, and the prolapses, I mean, that's where I would say the first go round was, was worse, but you know, I mean, then you, you talk about, I mean, it was, it was even more crowded the second time around and there was, um, yeah, the, this bar biting behavior, which, which is a product of the extreme crowding. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's yeah, splitting a hair that's like pretty kind of gross and uncomfortable to even be splitting hairs like that. But I think we should just for yeah. the sake of accuracy. No, it's good. So it's so I understand. So the first time you saw the prolapses and you saw the agonal distress where the pig looks like they're having a seizure and then they just die right in front of you. Um, the second time you still had the bar biting, right? You still have because- oh, actually the first time we didn't, I, I mean, I'm sure it's, it happens, uh-huh. but yeah, the second time was when we saw a lot of the okay. bar biting behavior. Yeah. And these are like in, um, and just, and just so I understand, in the, the literature on zoos, they'll talk about repetitive behaviors. We have a big cat like going back and forth, or you have a fish just swimming in circles. And I think the term is either stereotypy or stereotypy. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Stereotypic, yeah. Yeah. So you have these like stereotypic behaviors. And that's sort of what you're talking about with like the, the repetitive biting, right? 
Yep, exactly. Yeah. And I think you could just imagine what it would be like if you're locked in a cage where you can't stand up, you can't turn around, you, you can't even like touch your, your t- like you're, you're just stuck in one position, kind of like lying down. Um, awful. And, and I just, I just, just to be super clear, the, these, yeah. it, there wasn't gestation crates at this facility, so it was there a wasn't. larger okay. pen, but okay. it was in terms of the space that each individual had, it was about the same. So, um, in, oh, as okay. what a gestation crate would be. Got but, it. Okay. So, so I was saying that you, it's it's more common to see that stereotypic bar biting in gestation crates. I'd actually have never seen it or heard of it in a non-gestation facility. But I mean, if there's crowding, like I that's going to. I understand. Yeah, that's really good. I'm glad I clear. I asked for clarification. Yeah. So it's um, they weren't in gestation crates, but they, they had, each pig had the similar amount of space that they might have within a gestation crate, mm-hmm. and they were doing the kinds of of stereotypical behaviors that. Um, they would be doing these repetitive stress behaviors that you that you see in gestation crates. You're seeing mm-hmm. them do this in these other settings too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you. And it was still uh, like f- fairly dirty, like feces everywhere. The second time too. Yeah. I mean, equally. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's 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 just gonna that's gonna happen just immediately. You know. I mean, that's and the typical thing is that you know they they don't. I mean, when you put a thousand pigs in a barn, you're not right. going to like bring them in and out all the time. I mean, what happens in as a matter of reality is that it gets cleaned, you know, once every year or how, however long the life cycle of pigs are six months, it varies. Um, you know, it gets cleaned once every six months and then it's six months of just accumulating just filth. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why the pigs didn't have these prolapses the second time, um, what would you say that is? Oh, they've, I don't want to venture too much of a sure. guess. I'm okay. obviously not like a veterinarian, right. but there's there's various conditions that can that can sort of be spread amongst the the herd. Um, diarrhea, I know, is one thing that can cause it, uh, okay. but I, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I guess I was just curious if it was something like like maybe the pigs were just younger, so it didn't happen to them yet, or if it was something like better disease can like better cleanliness, so they didn't have the diseases or better antibiotics. But it's imp- probably impossible to to say, but. What? Yeah. And if we, you know, and sometimes when we've done investigations, we've had the benefit of, of better information, and uh-huh. more, more time and more visits here. They're very much cracking down on that and they're locking doors right. and they're, they're, you know, legislatively and physically doing everything they can to prevent us from, from getting accurate information. So we kind right. of educated guesses on some of this is the best we can do. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm just going to register is my admiration that you folks are able to get into places like this, especially after you've already said that you've investigated this place. I like, I, I don't know how you do it. I don't, I don't want to know. Like, don't tell me. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know you're not going to because you have good like security culture, but like, I'm just amazed that you release an investigation. You're still able, still able to go back in. Uh, it just blows my mind. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so the, the slew of new bills came out. Um, and why don't we let, let's talk about 20, 2388 first. And I'm going to, um, why don't you describe it? And then what I'll do is I'll share the screen and I'll take people to the places where they, they talk about the things you talk about. So yeah, what's going so, on in Bill 2388? Yeah. So folks, if you're a big animal rights person, you may be familiar with what, what's been known as the King Amendment uh, to the Farm Bill uh, that's been proposed a few times in the past it has not actually been included, but this is, uh, you know, it's called the King Amendment because it was proposed by um, Iowa Congressman Steve King, and he's a congressman at the federal level, which is where the, the Farm Bill is passed. And uh, base, uh, what, what, what the King Amendment would do is to nullify all state level uh, animal welfare laws and say it can only be regulated at the federal level. So things like California's Proposition 2, Proposition 12, uh, F- California's fur ban, you know, San Francisco's uh, fur ban, uh, just a huge amount of animal welfare legislation wiped away from the books. And all that's left is the federal regulation, which is which is practically non-existent. And, and maybe we want to go into that. But to to, to say about in, in Iowa, what they've done is basically the state level equivalent of the King Amendment, which would um, nullify all um, county and, and city level um, uh, livestock uh, regulation. So if you have any sort of thing at your county or city level that you know, regulates how cows or pigs or chickens are treated, this would uh, not only nullify that, but it would prevent the passage of, of future laws at the city or county level and say, Hey, the state's going to take control of it. And man, if you see the sort of stuff that's being proposed at the state level, uh, you know, that's, that's basically just leaving the animals uh, very much hanging out to dry. Yeah. Good. And so before we look at this, so people understand there's only two um, like federal laws that govern the treatment for most farm animals, right? 
Um, well, yes. actually, yeah, for some of them, there's like nothing like for chickens. Right. But, um, and you like, what, what, what are those two? What are those two? So, federal? so, so yeah, so it's, it's at the federal level, 95% of animals have no protection, uh, at the federal level. And the animals that do have protection only have protection for like 1% of their entire lifespan. So specifically, uh, chickens have, have no federal protections whatsoever. Uh, they're, you know, po- poultry is exempt from, uh, federal animal welfare legislation, but for for mammals, uh, the protections that exist are the Humane Slaughter Act and uh, what's known as the 28 hour rule. So basically, we have regulations around animals being transported and animals being slaughtered, uh, but but no regulations on the federal level whatsoever of food animals during their actual life cycle inside of farms. Yeah, good. So if you're somebody, even if you're not an animal rights activist, if you care at all about animal welfare. Um, you can't rely on the federal statutes because other other than you know the Humane Slaughter Act and the 28 hour rule, uh, which governs transport and slaughter, they're they're not protected. And even those two don't touch chickens at all. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's just so it's you know so infuriating when you see like Steve King. He goes and talks about this, and and he talks about this on constitutional grounds, which yeah. like actually as I mentioned earlier is like. It actually is, is a fair constitutional argument. If you just go pure constitution, you talk about the Commerce Clause, which says that one state cannot regulate the commerce of another state. So the argument goes like, well, how can California say that eggs need to be raised in XYZ standards if those are eggs raised in Iowa to be sold to California? California, you know, so on a constitutional level, like maybe that's like a, a, a decent argument. On a moral level, it's just, it's, it's abhorrent. Who is going to look you in the eyes and say that there's, there should be literally no regulations for the way that animals are raised? Like, that's completely absurd. And so, yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, oh, yeah, let's, you know, and, and, and Steve King, obviously, would just never says a, a word about, about the way animals are actually treated. It's just this whole, you know, constitutional procedural stuff. It's just like, Jesus, dude, come on. Right. Okay. So let, let's, look at, let's look at this text. So I'm going to do a screen share. Um, okay, so you can see the screen now, right? You can see. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. so basically, um, they start by just defining some things, define what an animal is, uh, what an animal enterprise is. So they're talking about um, you know, domesticated animals. And so basically, this is referring to agri- agriculture. So we're not, we're not really talking about research here. And what they say, and this is sort of the crucial part, um, a city shall not adopt, enforce, or administer an ordinance, motion, resolution, or amendment that regulates an animal enterprise or a working animal. Um, This subsection does not do any of the following. Apply to a commercial establishment required to be issued or renewed an authorization under Chapter 162. And, and so this is going to have to do with things like animal shelters, boarding kennels, commercial breeders, commercial kennels, dealers, pet shops, pounds, public auctions, research facilities, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. So, so not talking about that, um, but it leaves, you know, all of agriculture is still, still in this. And right. it also doesn't impair a city for enforcing a federal or state law. So if you could have a federal or state law, which, you know, there are really, there aren't very many, especially at the federal level. Mm-hmm. Um, but and you could still enforce that. But if if your city is like, hey, we want to, you know, regulate um, the ways that pigs are raised within our city, it sort of robs them of their autonomy to pass, fat, you know, welfare uh, legislation like that. So it's yeah, it's it's um yeah. And 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 nobody, you know, I I think people would assume it's the case. But yeah, in, in Iowa, and this was something we were looking at with with these investigations. The uh, Iowa uh, laws in terms of, you know, the state laws that, that regulate livestock treatment are, are virtually non-existent even before the, this whole new round of, of, of laws. Uh, I mean, it's, it's effectively um, livestock cruelty doesn't exist if it's, it's done by the owner or somebody authorized by the owner. So livestock cruelty just isn't a thing under Iowa law. And so, you know, it, it's fairly benign to say, you know, oh, well, the cities don't pass laws. We just keep it to the state level, right? It just, you know, like, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is it neutral? Like, I don't know. It sounds fine. The state's, you know, when you dig into the details, it's just void. <laughs> it's, just, or it's just devoid of, of any anything at the state or at the federal level. And so that's really where it's at. Wow. So that that is that is just that is just wild. Um, okay. <laughs> so let's now talk about... Um, 
uh, 2214, which is another one. So before we talk about it, uh, do you want to just describe what, what, what that one, what, what, what's going on there? Yeah, let me get that pulled up here. So, um, so this this one, I mean, I, I I feel like every time we bring one of these up, I'm just yeah. gonna be like, you thought the last one was shocking. Like, I don't know which one's like the most outrageous. Uh, but what what this one does in in so many words, and they do use many words to try to get people to get worn out or confused or click away. Uh, but basically, it just makes it so that nobody can really report livestock cruelty. So it says that, um, that that veterinarians, so obviously a person who went to school, who's trained, who's a professional, if a veterinarian makes a recommendation uh, saying that this is uh, criminal livestock abuse, criminal livestock cruelty, criminal livestock neglect, uh, and there's not any enforcement action taken, then the veterinarian is now liable uh, for for damages for, for the cost of investigating legal fees and then actually a fine up to five thousand dollars on top of it. So that means that if a veterinarian makes an honest mistake, which human beings do that from time to time, uh, then a veterinarian is liable. But it also means that if a veterinarian makes an accurate assessment and saying this is what I'm seeing here, you know, this is a violation of the law under X Y Z rule, even if that's completely accurate, and the prosecution decides not to do which prosecutions fully can choose, you know, they have discretion to choose what they prosecute, what they don't prosecute. And certainly in places like Iowa and in some of these, you know, ag counties where there's a lot of political power, uh, they're not going to prosecute a lot of these. And so a veterinarian is liable in that case when they're totally truthful and accurate and have integrity and are doing the right thing. Just defies belief. Yeah. So when you first told me this, I was like, come on. I was like, come on, you've got, this has to be the sort of thing where activists are like exaggerating some, but no, like let's, let's take a look at the statute. Yeah. Um, 10 is the, the crucial one. So if an animal removed to custody is returned to an enterprise, the court shall assess each veterinarian who signed a statement of confiscation, all of the following, all expenses incurred by the enforcement agency in moving and assess, assuming custody of the animal. The expenses shall be assigned to each veterinarian on a prorated basis. Two, all reasonable expenses incurred by the enterprise, including attorney fees, investigative fees, court costs. Um, sorry. Communication expenses, witness fees and expenses, and travel expenses. Uh, the recovery of expenses shall only take place after final agency action is taken under Chapter 17A or upon judicial review after final disposition of the case by the court. And then here's the crucial part. So if an animal removed to custody is returned to the enterprise, each veterinarian who signed a statement of confiscation shall be subject to a fine of not less than $1,000 and not more than $5,000. Each animal removed shall be considered a separate offense. So it's, it's just shocking. You, you know, already like in, in this, in this bill, um, the only veterinarians who are allowed to participate in this process are, are you, you get two, basically one appointed by the enterprise. So they, you know, as you told me earlier, like they, they can just call their friends. He was friendly. And another one by the enforcement agency. <laughs> and then, so you're, they're really going to be selecting for veterinarians who are going to be upholding the status quo. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, yeah. like imagine if, if, if a citizen, you know, be like, okay, here's, here's what the laws in the books say, which the laws in the books are already just egregiously yeah. in favor of industry to begin with. But mm -hmm. let's just say, even if the laws were fair, be like, hey, Aaron, uh, citizen person, you, you get to choose, you know, you might violate the law, but you get to choose any police officer to, to, you know, to do the enforcement, to do the inspection on it. It's like, okay, so how do I find one you know, a cop that's my friend or one cop that's corrupt. This just defies yeah. belief. And, and, and to ahead. make that as worse, the cop, if, if a third party who's, a, who's, who's maybe one of my friends also decides not to like find me guilty. Now the cop has to pay a fine. Yeah. And, 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 and I want to point out this, this is directly like obviously in response to, to what DXE does, because we, we say, I mean, poor, poor Shirsten Rosenberg, I shouldn't even say because she doesn't feel like scared or anything by this, but, you know, Shirsten Rosenberg is this veterinarian that she, she's at Happy Hand Animal Sanctuary. She wrote up this opinion for us. She's extremely knowledgeable. She obviously went to a lot of schooling for this. She knows her stuff inside and out. And then she has this law written, which, you know, is, is clearly just targeted directly at her. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know what, what else to say. I mean, it's just, you know, we just need to get a lot more attention drawn to this because there's just no way, you know, ordinary people would not have the same reaction that you and I have. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I think the, the, some of the difficulties are just that obviously it's written in a way that is designed to make people not want to read, like not want to keep reading it. Um, and also not very, not very many people sit down and look through the laws and not a lot of people think about animal issues, but I, I, th I think that like everybody should be able to understand why this is ridiculous. And, and yeah, and if I could, before we move on with this, I want to point out one one additional aspect of this, which Do is it. just so ridiculous, is that they talk about, um, you know, their definition of what animals can be removed because they look at you know, okay, DXE does you know a lot of animal rescues or removes animals. Their criteria is that an animal should be likely to die in order to be removed, in order for it to be lawfully removed. So if an animal, if a veterinarian says, hey, this is horrible animal cruelty, this animal's in bad shape, we need to confiscate this animal for the animal's own good. Um, and, and then somebody later comes in and, and, and their criteria is, is likely to die, which means 51%. Now, imagine what kind of cruelty you can inflict upon an animal where it's not quite 51% that they're going to die. How much physical, psychological, I mean, there's so much horrific cruelty that can be inflicted upon an animal before they quite hit that threshold. If you're really splitting hairs, like an animal that's 45% chance they're going to die. I mean, if you really get down to it, that's the, the, the farm needs to be prosecuted on that circumstance. It's like, just on so many levels, like every aspect of this, every step of this, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I think we've, we've made the point. Yeah. No, that, that is, that's another thing to think about. Yeah. It's like, Sometimes we are afraid for our lives. That does happen. But often what we're afraid of is something a little bit less than death. It might be being maimed. It might be having a horrific mm -hmm. injury. It might be the psychological trauma that comes from the horrific events that we, we see. You know? Yeah. And it's, I mean, and it, it also reminds me of like an argument that people make sometimes in, you know, probably often in good faith, mm -hmm. people will say like, well, well, isn't it the farmer's best interest to treat animals well? Like for their own bottom line, it's like, it's, it's in their best interest to not like have a gaping wound in the side of their cow that they send to the slaughterhouse, but so much try. I mean, you know, what, what if I, if I put a dog in a kennel for, for six months straight, that's the most efficient way to produce cheap dog meat. Don't move, stay there. Horrific existence, pure torture, you know? And so there's just this, obviously this just gulf of difference between you know, an actual decent standard of life versus, uh, you know, the, the, the standard that you would give for maximum profit. Right. Okay. And I, and there's something interesting about this, which is that if the animal is likely to die, then it hurts the farmer's bottom line to keep them in there. Right. Uh, well, in, in general, yeah. I mean, right. I think with, with the, with the, with the veterinarian, I mean, they don't want veterinarians poking around in there for, right. for any which way. So yeah, they, it's in their best interest to kill them yeah. and throw them and throw them in the dumpster. Uh, right. but yeah, they're going to do everything they can to keep vets out of there no matter what, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I guess this is just to say, like, if you have an animal who isn't likely to die, like if you have somebody who is likely to survive long enough to be, to get up to slaughter weight and then they kill them, um, it would not be in the farm's best interest to have that animal confiscated and treated. But the, the only uh, case where it's in the farm's best interest to have the animal confiscated and treated is when um, the animal is going to die before it gets to the point where you could actually, you know, use them. Or if, if they're so sick that they're not going to be usable for slaughter. Exactly, like exactly. Yeah, and so, so like, if we can really see these, like we can really see that the, the kind of standard where the animal is likely to die as not even coming, not even having to have anything to do with a concern for the interests of animals with simply saying, okay, well, here's a case where it would hurt the farmer's bottom line. So we're going to, mm -hmm. you know, go with that and say that that's the situation where we're going to um, allow the animal to be taken away. Yeah. It's, I mean, t top to bottom, they <laughs> put, put, well, I shouldn't say a lot of thought because I think they made yeah. a lot of mistakes, but they, you know, they, they thought this stuff through. Yeah. It reminds me of some, some Shakespeare um, is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Ah, Macbeth. Um, except that it's signifying something, which is, yeah, okay. Anyways, but there was a lot of sound and fury here, and there, I think there were some idiots involved in the construction of this. So let's um, <laughs> let's uh, let's let's go on now to um, 
sort of our, our, our th- uh, another thing we should talk about, which is the Bernie Sanders disruption. So I had Rachel on the show about a, I think it was about like maybe two weeks ago, something like that. Um, and it was a really fascinating conversation because I got to talk to her about the whole, you know, discussion going into um, like, like what it was like for her to go through the whole process. Got to talk to her a little bit about um, the, the kind of thinking behind it and, and the ways that you evaluate the success of these kinds of actions. But so I'm kind of interested just to kind of hear the role that you played with respect to this action and then also how you evaluate the success of the action and um, any other thoughts that you have about it. Yeah. Well, first thing I want to give a quick update. I don't know if people are aware. We just got news the other day that the charges were officially dropped on that, Okay. Uh, which is good. Those were you know, as it is with so much of our work, it's like the things that are kind of the most fucked up are also kind of useful in terms of media narrative. Uh, But yeah, they had been facing these indecent exposure charges, which uh, could have, would have landed them on the sex offender registry beyond the, beyond the pale. Uh, So those charges just got dropped. So that's uh, a really good uh, thing, obviously, and managed to get some, uh, some attention drawn to the issue in the process. So so that all worked out. Uh, but anyways, yeah, b- big picture, uh, you know, and I, I know I'm not telling you anything new, but for, for the sake of, of uh, some folks out there that might be kind of newer to these sorts of things, uh, social justice movements throughout history have, uh, have, you know, risen and fallen with the prominence of, of nonviolent direct action. That's not to say that all nonviolent direct action is equal, certainly, but as a general matter, uh, when, you have, uh, w- when you have a just cause, but you just don't have power, uh, then this is kind of how you leverage that is by you, you be provocative, you be, you do protests, you, you get your message out there. You can even be, you know, quite unpopular. Uh, and, and people's first intuition is, has, is, is certainly not always the case. Sometimes it is the case that, uh, that protesters themselves being unpopular doesn't translate to the protests, uh, the protest itself being unsuccessful. And so sort of the metric that, that has, mostly prevailed uh, with still with, with some exceptions, like we don't want to totally broad brush everything is that what matters most is that your message is clearly understood, not so much that it is uh, positively received. So, I mean, you look back, you know, the, the, the lunch counter sit-ins, you look back at uh, women suffragettes who were, I mean, the, these cartoons that were put out were just horrifically sexist. And it's like all these rabble rousing women who are unhappy with their lives and they're depressed and they're unmarried and they're like, whatever, you know, all, all these distractions, which animal rights activists face the same thing. So many times they just, you know, attack the messenger because they ain't got nothing to say about the message itself. Um, but that, but that is what prevails. So you look at something like these political disruptions, we have, uh, you know, the reason we would consider them to be a success and specifically look at the, the one that Rachel was involved with across the board, the media coverage, they knew our message. They knew these were anti-dairy protesters. I mean, and frankly, the fact that it's breaking news and the fact that journalists are kind of lazy sometimes like the rest of us works to our benefit because you're just like, oh shit, something crazy just happened. I need to do a breaking news story and I need to do it quick. Well, I have this perfectly wit- written news article that just arrived in my inbox. So let me change out a couple quick sentences of it and basically publish DXC's press release as my article. And the, court- and the Bernie Sanders campaign doesn't want to say anything about it because again, we're right. We are factually correct. And they don't want to elevate it because it just makes them look like hypocrites. So they don't comment on it. So there's no, there's no two sides to it. So it's just, they just publish our press releases. That's what the media looks like. Um, and that's even, it was even more so the case subsequently with the Joe Biden protest on Super Tuesday. That was even, you know, more of a big stage uh, covered in the New York Times two days in a row. Got this long form piece in the New Republic, which is extremely positive. I, I mean, just uh, could not believe it. Um, and I mean, in Vox, I mean, across the board, just, just tons and tons of coverage um, that, yeah, I think like the Let Dairy Die recent protests have, have been very successful. Um, which again is not not to not to say that all of all of them always have been, but uh, yeah, I think everybody's feeling pretty good about them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it was, um, oh yeah. So, so you covered so much there, and we get the idea <laughs> that like in a social movement, uh, the goal isn't always for the protesters to be liked. Um, and one of the goals you mentioned was to kind of get the message out there, and you've you've certainly done that here, where it's not just that you raised an issue; it's that you got a whole lot of really powerful news sources with a lot of coverage to um, to basically publish your your press release for the most part. Like it was, and and like the New York Times article, especially, I think that one was talking about like, why are there let dairy die protesters? They were really 
um, interested, it seemed, in showing your perspective. So that was that, that was amazing. I was I was blown away by how successful that that action was. Um, is that the primary, t- uh, I guess, metric for success that you think of? Just um, for, obviously, we're not talking about long term metrics because long term metrics are like the death of the dairy industry. But in terms of like proximal mm-hmm. goals, is uh, is the main metric you're looking at just how many news sources um, show your your press release? Yeah, so that's a good question. So it does vary. Uh, I think sort of what people will often go to, and 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 we as well in many cases is to say you you should have a, a campaign with a concrete goal. And so you say like, hey, we have this ask, and we're going to keep upping the pressure. We're going to keep escalating, put pressure on this individual until they make a certain concession. And certainly. You know, I'm, I'm on board with that. I think most people are on board with that for the most part. Um, in these particular select circumstances that realistic probably doesn't apply, we don't have the, the power and there's, there's so much pushing against them to ignore this issue right now that it's not realistic. So, you know, when it is, uh, so, so as a general rule, I think plugging it into a campaign is, is the way to go and, and something where concrete where you're actually going to have some win on paper that you can specifically point to is the way to go. But in these circumstances where there is just so much exposure that's possible, then 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 I think that makes sense uh, to, to do that and just say, hey, we're just getting a message out there where there are millions of people that are hearing this and those millions of people that are reading the New York Times and watching Joe Biden's speech. I think what they generally, what the kind of common takeaway is that like, maybe those people are a little unhinged or like whatever, but something about the dairy industry is probably pretty unethical. And if you transfer, and if you say that happened to millions of people, you know, hundreds of thousands, at least probably millions of people that are, that are now slightly, you know, a bit more stigmatized towards the dairy industry. I mean, I don't see how that's not a huge win. Yeah. That's a huge win at the end of the day. I also think a lot about the kind of ecology of, of the, of the movement. So sometimes what we'll, we'll do is we'll be like, okay, here's this campaign. Here's how it fits into a theory of social change. But another thing to ask to talk about is like, how does this campaign fit into um, the overall ecosystem of other campaigns? And I, I think that uh, there was like the Joaquin Phoenix speech at the Golden Globes, where he was very strong in his condemnation of the dairy industry, and that had the dairy industry on on, on the uh, defensive. And but I think that was perceived as kind of like an accessible moderate sounding kind of thing where mainstream people were able to listen to that and not just see him as kind of like your stereotypical, um, as you put it, I think you used the word unhinged. Is that the word you used? Yeah. 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 Unhinged, I, think, like, I think that's what people think. Yeah. They, yeah. When they see some of that. Like he doesn't, he, he didn't come across as like the unhinged animal rights activist. And I think mm-hmm. that his, I think that what, what you did was you're able to make him seem even more reasonable. I think he also made you seem more reasonable. So you get kind of like the symbiotic relationship between these two sides where, um, he looks reasonable in comparison. And then you also look more reasonable because you're, you're sharing the same message that has been promoted yeah. on the Golden Globes. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that kind of ecosystem approach to these? Yeah, topics? oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's the uh, obviously you're very familiar with the term the radical flank effect. But for mm-hmm. people who aren't, that's what you uh, kind of refer to. It's kind of you know the good cop bad cop thing where somebody comes in and they're really strident with a message and they're abrasive or like whatever turns somebody off, and then somebody else comes in and says basically the same thing in a more sympathetic way. So that I, th- I think there's plenty of validity to that. But let's just say even if if people are Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, maybe interpreting things a little less charitably and be like, well, no, Joaquin Phoenix has the right idea and y'all are not, you know, he's coming off as more sympathetic and y'all are coming off as like, whatever, to which my response is like, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix, what he did is awesome. And if anybody wants to invite me on stage at the Oscars, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I think right. it's wonderful. And so, you know, we work within, you know, the confines that we have. And, uh, and so, you know, if, if we the, if we can have a stage and it's sympathetic and people will listen to and millions of people will listen to me talk for hours and hours, that's great. And if we don't, then you know we have to deal with what we got. Yeah, well, that's that's good. And I guess like just to um, I want to say one quick thing about like the radical flank effect. So I think we actually have two effects here. We have the moderate flank effect and the radical flank effect. Where I think he was able to moderate you, and you're able to. Um, yeah, so so you did that. But we also get both positive and negative radical flank effects. And I think this could have gone either way. So like one way the radical flank effect works is that the radical actors make the moderate actors seem more like moderate in comparison. And that's the positive radical flank effect. But the way a negative radical flank effect works is that your radical actors kind of like tarnish 
the moderate actors and it hurts them. It makes it harder for them to actually like, like do their thing. And so you could have somebody who's kind of in the middle and they get tarnished by their association with some more radical actor. And so in a lot of like anti-PETA activism over the years has worked sort of like that, where people are like, hey, they've worked with the animal, liber- they've like supported the animal liberation front. So they're trying to like consciously generate this negative radical flank effect. So I think what's like especially cool about this is that it doesn't seem like you did, like it doesn't seem like you hurt Joaquin Phoenix. It, it really does seem like this symbiotic thing. So it's, uh, it's remarkable. Yeah, th- thank you. And I, I mean, I, I certainly am inclined to agree with that. And I think that, you know, we, I, and I, I just want to be clear to people that we're not, you know, it's not like we're indifferent to mm-hmm. what our, what, how it's received or how positively it's received. We want it to be as received as positively as it can. In reality, if you're, if you're jumping up on stage at a political rally, there's going to be a certain negativity that comes with it. But, um, you know, what I would say is that um, we did every, you know, within the confines of like, okay, we want to do this dramatic thing to get press and we know it's going to be controversial to some extent. But what are the things we can do to mitigate that to still get as much exposure as possible, but try to make it as positive as possible. So we spent a lot of time thinking through our narrative, tying it out, figuring out how, you know, what's what's Joe Biden's, you know, got the quotes. And we just spent a lot of time in it. We also did an investigation where people actually went to Vermont uh, dairy farms that were uh, supplied to Ben and Jerry's with uh, obviously Bernie Sanders from Vermont and his campaign co-chair is Ben Cohen. So we had, you know, we really had this narrative really, really tied together that comes off a lot different than, um, you know, kind of a more generic animal rights message where you're jumping on a random, you know, jumping in front of cameras, wherever they exist and just saying animal, you know, something generically animal rightsy that's going to trend you more towards uh, negative. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of these, these conversations are just happening 20. I mean, this is my life. It's, it's obsessive. People worry a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. And I think, so one, one question I think a lot of people have is like, how do the decisions get made in DXC about these actions? Like, are you like a mastermind? Is is Wayne pulling the strings like from <laughs> way beyond? Um, after have an altar? Stopped- well, no, if I turn the camera on, you'll see my altar to Wayne. It's up in the corner. There's like candles and it's like a whole, we do a ceremony every night. Uh, I can call, you can I- maybe do another Zoom call later. We can show me that. Yeah, you should be careful. So, so for the record, Matt was being facetious. So I think a lot of people do believe that that's actually the way it is um, in DXC. <laughs> yeah, so I... I'm Wayne's boss, in fact, having oh. been recently voted to uh, to the uh, uh, Direct Action Everywhere uh, SF Bay Chapter Core uh, okay. leadership team. Congratulations. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I mean, that's slightly facetious as well, because Wayne is a major mentor of mine, extremely knowledgeable, hardworking, all the things, you know. Uh, in terms of how specific decisions are made, it's very consensus-based. It's very loosely organized, and it's it, ba- it it almost never happens, you know, I mean, first of all, structurally, there really is there. I, I could go into the bylaws and the specifics, but there's, there's number one, not a lot of mechanisms where you outright tell somebody, no, you absolutely cannot do this. Um, and, and whatever, to whatever extent those things do exist, they are very rarely actually invoked in a matter of reality. So we, you know, we have a community of people who are on the same page, like, People are doing, nobody's doing this because they're trying to get rich. <laughs> you know, that ain't happening. Uh, so people, you know, it's this consensus-based thing. You talk to people, you talk to kind of people who have some knowledge and some experience who have something at stake here. You come to kind of where everybody stands. But honestly, but ultimately, if if you're the person who's putting in the time and the energy and making something happen, you kind of get the ultimate say-so uh, to make these kind of calls. Um, sure. So just, just kind of like a... Um so I, maybe you could comment on a couple of things Rachel's put it out. And I think that they really kind of play into this. So one thing Rachel said was that uh, you reached out to her and said, hey, do you wanna, are you interested in, in, in a disruption and like in a high stakes action, something like that? Um, and she was really intrigued by that. So like there must have been some kind of like a planning that happened before you pulled in all the people to, to, to jump on stage. What was that part of the process like? Uh, boy, I mean, I've done a bunch of these, so it's hard to remember specifically, but as a general matter, I, I'm, I'm a news politics junkie, so I'm always seeing what's going on. And so Mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, there is uh, this event that I think we can get people to, and it makes sense. And so I would kind of, um, float it to, I mean, usually it starts off with whoever's kind of physically close to me or whoever (laughs) I'm talking to and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? Is there any like big reason why this is a horrible idea that I'm not thinking of and whatever? And you know, you ask to a few more people, then I would go to like the, um, 
core to, to, mm-hmm. to DXCSFA leadership and kind of get their buy-in. Um, I talked to uh, the folks in Compassionate Bay, which is a sister organization uh, to DXC that does legislation because uh, they are um, rightfully, you know, they have, they're wary, they're supportive, but wary in terms of uh, because they have to pass legislation, they have to work with legislators, usually local legislators. And so you kind of got, got to be careful about these kind of things to be how, how radical are you? Is, are you a group that your legislator is going to want to be publicly if, you know, allied with that kind of a thing? Um, so yeah, yeah, basically that's, those are kind of the two main, just specifically would be like core and then the compassionate Bay group and then sort of a hodgepodge of folks around me. Okay. So you come, so like you come up with the, like some kind of idea by just watching news and politics. Then you talk to the people around you. So you talk to like your, you know, anybody who, who, who is within shouting distance. Um, and then you, you find core, you, you talk to people, to people in this, in San Francisco Bay core, you talk to compassionate Bay. Um, and then at that point you reach out to the activists, you say, Hey, are you interested in doing this, this action? Is that, nope. is that fair? Cool. Yep. And then, um, in terms of like, this democratic process. Another thing that Rachel told me was that she, she was she was totally up for um, doing another naked like a topless disruption, but Core thought that it would be better if she didn't do a topless the second time, and she agreed with them because of you know she already had the uh, indecent and obscene ex- exposure charges and them you know she might go to jail. She did that again, but. Uh, that part of the process is then like the activists and core are kind of interact with each other. Is that how that works? Yeah. I, and it's, uh, so, and like I said, it, it wouldn't ever, or, you know, basically never, I mean, outside of like violating DXC values, it'd be like, you know, if you're going to do something violent, like mm-hmm. that's well, outside DXC values, you wouldn't do it. So that's, that's a rare example would be a violation of values. Something like this certainly is not a violation of DXC values. Uh, but in that case, it would come down to, well, here's, you know, here's our suggestion. And uh, also a very important consideration is legal support. Right. So we might say, hey, this isn't a violation of DXC values, but we don't think it's the best use of, you know, potentially our legal resources. So we won't be able to support you, which is obviously a, a pretty important thing. Yeah. Um, okay. That makes sense. So, um, yeah. So uh, there aren't rallies right now. Trump's not doing his oh, rallies. Yeah. Oh, we were just getting warmed up. It was going great. All right. Yeah. There's no rallies going on. So what does disruption look like? What does DXC look like in a time of a global pandemic when you have to physically isolate? So we are, uh, I mean, everybody, everything's moving to the virtual world. Uh, for the most part, we actually <clears throat> will do a few things very carefully and, and well thought out uh, in, in person. There are some folks that went up to the uh, Capitol building and uh, you know, practice their social distancing and had the right biosecurity gear and so on. So there's things here or there that you can kind of do in the real world, but yeah, largely that's that's out. And so we are moving more to uh, like social media influencing, getting a bunch of people to uh, you know do various things uh, on Facebook and, and particularly on Twitter. Twitter is where the the journalists are hanging out, where the you know you can actually reach some influential people much easier than you can on any of the other platforms. So that's um, we haven't really gotten into that. We're just starting to kind of put the feelers out there and make that happen. But uh, yeah, the idea would be to have a big old army of thousands or tens of thousands or whatever it gets to. So that's hmm. the plan. Yeah, well, that, that, that's, that's pretty wild. Um, and I've noticed that I've seen a lot of you know events being launched online that, that DXC is doing. I know that one of the things that that draws a lot of people into various activism organizations is the sense of community. Um, for me, I think what, when I started hanging out in uh, Chicago, I remember going to like these, these amazing potlucks and what can groups do to try to still have that kind of, kind of community online? Have you seen things that work? Have you seen things that don't work? Yeah, we've, uh, so yeah, all the meetings and, you know, stuff that we normally have, we have various working groups. I lead the press working group. So that mm-hmm. stuff has all moved to, to like zoom calls. The big thing now, everybody's got the house party app which I'm going to be uh, actually two hours from right now as we're recording this is a little house party gathering of sorts that people are going to be doing. So huh. yeah, we hang out and uh, hey, you might, you should come actually. Let's huh. yeah, I guess it'd be a little late uh, where you're at, but anyway, you know, we, we, we normally do in-person gatherings as a community, you know, whoever's local and SF Bay area chapter. Uh, and now it's all kind of moved online, which 
you know, sort of fills that void a little bit. It's a little hard to, uh, you know, got a whole room full of people talking. It's easier to like dip off to one corner and talk to somebody than it is in a Zoom call. It's like, uh, but yeah. we make do. Okay, that's exciting, and I'll, uh, I'll definitely. I, so I've never seen this app, but I'll, I'll look, I'll look into it after the, to the call. It sounds cool. Um, yeah, great. So this has been a really fantastic, wide ranging discussion. I think we've covered a lot. We've been talking for quite a while. We, we got to see everything from uh, four year old Matt to to today um with going to the house party later and is there anything uh anything else you want to you want you want to say to the, the viewers before we well i would be remiss if i didn't uh talk about the uh okay here we go uh so this is the official wang gang hat and when i say official i mean uh something that i just came up with and i ordered like 30 of these hats uh so Wanted to, to give that a little shout out. These, these are definitely less cool than they were. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know if people get the reference. This is, you know, Andrew Yang had the math hats. They're blue and they said math. And then it was like it, Yang 2020. So we're going, we're going uh, with, with authorization by our new, I guess it's an announcement to most people who are watching this, uh, Berkeley mayoral candidate Wayne. Uh, so instead of the Yang gang, we have the Wayne gang, which I don't think that's not really a hashtag that anybody is using yet because it's like semi-official. I don't know when this is actually going to get published, but yeah. anyway, it's a thing. It's out there. And mm -hmm. people want these hats, especially if you're in the Berkeley area, but even no matter what, you can let me know. Uh, yeah, I think I paid like 12 bucks each for them is what it works out to. So we're really excited. Like, I think there's a real shot that Wayne actually becomes, gets elected as mayor of Berkeley, which would just be beyond, beyond huge. Although that is a little more challenging in the social distancing era where you can't go around canvassing door to door, but we're still going to try to make it happen. And yeah, who knows? Come, come November, we, uh, we'll probably have Trump 2.0, but maybe we'll have Wayne 1.0 to kind of offset it a little bit. Wow. That, that would certainly be a wild development. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, thanks for showing up the hat. Well, well, anyway, so it's, it's been great. I'd like to thank viewers for tuning in. Um, it's always a pleasure and Matt, it's good to talk to you. I think like, no, it's, I don't think we've had like a, a good sit down chat for this amount of time in, in quite a while. So mm -hmm. this was, it was a real pleasure and definitely educational for me to learn about all this stuff. And we've talked about, we even got into some Shakespeare. So this was, there you this go. was a good time. It was a good time. All right. Yeah. All appreciate right. it very much. This has been super fun and we need to uh, do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Well, thank you. Say Thanks. So bye viewers.